So during the last session, we talked briefly about covering the horse race. And fortunately or unfortunately, if you're covering elections, you've always got to pay attention to who's up and who's down at some point, particularly as things get near the end. But it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, a lot of nuances to this, as, as many of you know, and we're going to hear about a few of them today. We're very happy to have with us Claudia Dean. She is the uh, Director of Research Practices at the Pew Research Center. Prior to that, she was with the Kaiser Family Foundation, where she worked on understanding the public's views on domestic health policy issues. Now, of course, she's more into politics. She also spent eight years as the Assistant Director of Polling at the Washington Post. So she's someone who's able to come at this from both the journalistic perspective and the science polling perspective, which we really appreciate. So interpreting and using polls in 2014, perfect topic. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I heard it's your first day. I hope you guys are all off to a good start and feeling energized. God bless you for still going into journalism. <laughs> um, and I like a conference room that has such easy access to the kitchen. This is, this is great. This is how I'd like to work at home. I'm going to kind of be standing and getting in your way variously because I have trouble sitting still. But my the official title of my talk today is Interpreting and Using Polls in 2014, but the off-the-record title is Polling 2014, What the Hell? Because <laughs> polling is really in, a, in kind of a state of chaos right now. Um, and we're all just trying to ride the waves and like get certified in Pilates for seniors as a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's just me, but... <laughs> um, I'm at the Pew Research Center now. I started my career there 18 years ago and wandered around a couple different places. And I just came back in January. And this is my uh, actually my first presentation I'm, I'm doing for them. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's kind of a Washington institution. They call themselves a fact tank. That's just because they want to distinguish themselves a little bit from a think tank in that they don't, not, they're not just nonpartisan. They're not ideological. They're not coming at it from one way or one side or the other. It's about 130 people. It's, a, it's an interesting mix of former journalists, high profile, mostly from big mainstream media publications and PhD social scientists, and everybody tries to get along and talk nice to each other and put out a product that the public can read, but that also is really rigorous. And they cover these topics, uh, you can hardly see, sorry, politics, media, social trends, religion, internet, Hispanics, global. So you'll undoubtedly, if you're covering um, pretty much anything, run into some of our reports. Um, we mainly do survey research and demographic research, so we have a ton of survey research experts on staff. I'm not actually our director of survey research. He couldn't come today, so I'm standing in for him, Scott Keeter, but I did get his picture in the talk. So you guys can always call him. All right. Forward. So the horse race, right? The horse race is what everybody knows. It's kind of, if you're a political pollster at all, it is where you stand or fall because it's the one number that gets out there. But it's really just one question out of like the millions of questions that are being asked at any one time. And I've just, not to be too high-minded about it, just ask you to sort of think more broadly about what a poll can do for you. At the Pew Research Center, the horse race is an infinitesimal part of what we do. We only do really a couple. We don't do any state uh, polls at all. Um, we're trying to scientifically represent what the public thinks, feels, and does right now. Now, um, polling may or may not going forward be the best way to, to represent what the public does, as what they do is more and more uh, has a digital footprint. But for now, it's kind of what we have. You know, we're trying to add scope to the anecdotes that you guys are telling that, that you're using the polls to do as well. You know, I met this woman who had this experience, and turns out, look, as 40% of Americans do the same. We're trying to track uh, the changes in attitudes over, over time, right? So. To the extent that you want to report about this massive shift in public opinion on uh, gay marriage, which is unlike anything I've seen in my career over the past 10 years, um, you, you just can't do that anecdotally, right? You have to have some sort of numbers behind it. And to give voice to people who aren't always heard. So if you want to know how Obamacare is going down, you might care about the uninsured, right? And they may not be the people that mo are most likely to be on the Sunday talk shows. So the bad news for you is that you guys are still the gatekeepers of this. You know, I did this uh, talk similar to this for the AEJMC. It's like the professors who are teaching journalism. And I went through like all the stuff they should be teaching their students about how to vet the polls. And they, they were like the angriest audience I ever had. I mean, they, they got <laughs> up and they were like, seriously, my students have to learn all this? Why don't you guys get your act together and police your own darn business? And, you know, it, sorry, it's just, it's just not happening. So 
right now you guys are what we have. I mean, the, the polling business is, you know, largely commercial, right? And so lots of stuff is proprietary. People are never going to agree on what standards you have to have. Um, and so, you know, you, you have to vet the polls. And maybe in your newsroom, it's not necessarily you, but for those of you guys who are big organizations, you know, you're going to have some, you may even have somebody who's doing polling, like Jenna Just at the AP or, you know, um, Scott Clement at the Washington Post. But so you can go to them to vet, but if you don't, you're going to have to sort of do it yourself. There's no peer review, like I said, there's varying methodological approaches and quality, and, and you guys are, you guys are it. So what we're going to try and talk about today is briefly this challenging question. Is the poll reliable enough to report, right? And just like I said, it's, get, it's getting a bit harder to answer. So usually um, I try and head off all the bad and nasty things people want to say about polls because, believe it or not, I already know all of them. <laughs> um, there's too many polls. There's more and more polls. Even I like wake up someday and I'm like, the QRD poll? What the heck? I, I don't know. i got to look it up, right? So it's not straightforward anymore. It's not just Gallup. Um, I'm sorry to block you. No, no, okay. Please. Um, response okay. rates, if you've heard they're going down, they are going down. Whoa, they are. When I started, used to be in low 40s. A response rate just means of the people I wanted to talk to, that I randomly selected I wanted to talk to, what percent did I actually get to talk to me through the entirety of a 15 minute interview? They were at like uh, 40 some odd percent. The thing about pollsters is because it's like an academically based thing, we're always in like a state of, you know, self doubting anxiety about it. So we were having a crisis at 40%, now we're having a crisis at 10%. Because that's what our Pew Research Center polls, which are, we're spending a lot of money on these, are not, you know, cheapo polls. We're getting 10 out of the 100 people we want. Either because we can't get them to answer the phone, or they answer the phone and hang up, right? Um, the, you know, before we used to have all in-person polls. Then we got this beautiful sort of era of the landline poll. Everyone eventually had a landline, and there weren't that many polls, and everybody was answering their landline. Okay, that, those Halcyon days are over. Now we have all these different modes. We're trying to figure out really fast. We don't have them figured out. So there's internet polls, the rise of cell phones. This was completely freaking everybody out, because if you think about it, you guys may not remember this. It's sort of quaint for you, but a landline poll, when you call, like a lot of the surveys that we care about or we study are... Um, government surveys, right? And some of the questions are sensitive. Like the CDC surveys are asking you about the number of sexual partners you had. And you used to be able to presume that we were calling you inside a structure, like a home or somewhere, a landline. And then you could go and be like, be right there, mom, and like go away, you know, hide. Now we're calling you in the line at the CVS, you know, on your cell phone. We, there, there's no expectation of privacy. But it turned out that didn't really matter because apparently we're happy to talk about that <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but our response rates are still bad on cell phones, but they're just bad like the landline. Um, we have new techniques for interviewing. So now we have IVR, interactive voice response, um, which basically means robocalling, right? So you guys have, I'm sure, gotten these on your cell phones. You know where someone calls and says, hello, I am calling from. And if it tends to be a young sounding woman with a Midwestern accent, that's because that's what data shows people are most likely to respond to. Um, so a robopoll, we don't know what that does. Um, Changes in legacy media polls is like a nice way to say fewer and fewer legacy media polls, which um, used to be something like benchmarks because at least they were completely transparent, right? And they were trying to stay on the news. And then we have a continuing increase in the language diversity of our country. And if you look at most polling methodologies, we're just interviewing in English. At Pew Research Center, we interview in Spanish. That's because we're funded by philanthropy. We have the money to do that. It's expensive, slows you down. Um, not everybody does that. And that means you're leaving some people out of your survey. So that's the end of the talk. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's kind of a bummer. So then, <laughs> that kind of, sorry. So the red flags are all in the methodology. Either the sample's not big enough, or they didn't use cell phones, so it can't oh, be. I'm going to work through all that in such exhaustive detail. You're going to be under the table. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yes. Most of them are about the methodology. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go through all some of the red flags, but it's a perfect question. This is what I'm talking about. But you know, on this thing, I feel like. You know how Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government except all the other forms? That's how I feel about polling. It's the crappiest way to survey, to do public opinion. It's just, it's the best we have. And if you don't have that, then you're going to be reduced to having to, you know, listen to what the pundits say the American public thinks. And doesn't that sound like a fate worse than death? <laughs> okay, the, here's the bottom line. The polls are still doing pretty well. And 
the scary part is we're not really sure why. So polling is based on, well, polling is based on a theory, a statistical foundation that's real that you can go to school and learn about, right? The thing is we're getting kind of far from the theory. We're getting, you know, it, it's, it's based on a theory that, you know, you have, um, you do random samples of the public, everybody has an equal chance of being selected, you know your whole public, and people are participating. Well, now we're, we're down to 10% response rates, we've got all these different modes, like, you can still see the theory down there, but I feel like I'm in a hot air balloon, like, I'm far up, but I can, I can at least see it. Whereas, when we talk a little bit later about the non-probability polls, there, you're just, whoo, you're, you, there's no theory even in sight, you're just on your own. But it's just, it's just a different era, but... You know, as Nate Silver is often pointing out, the irony is the input is getting worse, but the output still looks pretty good. Um, and this is just prediction on presidential elections, which is, you know, if you think about it, how, how are you going to ever prove I'm wrong? If I say X percent of Americans support gay marriage, what are you going to refute me with? Are you going to go around and ask everybody? No, there's no way. You have to have some sort of event where we measure what we think people think, and then they take some action, like an, like an election. We, we measure what they think they're going to vote. So this is where we are. Okay, so I'm a member of APOR. Most pollsters are, it's, it's very glamorous. It's the American Association of Public Opinion Research. And it's some sort of grouping of um, academics, some partisan pollsters, um, basically all the census people are there. It's headed by, you know, the head of Gallup. You know, it's a, it's a volunteer. It's like a, what's, I can't remember, what's the journalist organization? SBJ or yeah, NBJ like one of those, right? So they recently got into the fray a little bit, and I'll talk about it. But in general, I am quite, I feel quite confident in what they do. They sponsor a lot of um, training sessions, and they have a lot of reports. And I encourage you to, if you're curious about this, to go to their websites. They're always trying to commission task forces to sort of figure out, you know, where the gold standard is right now. And they're a really reliable source to quote. You can talk to whoever is the president right now. And they have these 10 questions to ask. I'll go through these one by one, but you know, it's on their website. It's worth looking at. I believe in the checklist, I just spent like uh, seven years in the whole public health arena, which was super interesting. I got really into the whole checklist, Otto Gawande checklist thing. Did everybody read that book? Super interesting. About how they can improve um, surgical results by just requiring surgeons to go through like it's a, this really silly sounding checklist that like your usual sort of egoic surgeon is not so excited about. But I really do sort of believe in this as a, a quick thing to have. If you're gonna be on a polling beat, I'd put it up somewhere and check stuff. So we'll go through. Practically speaking, there's not that much jargon and terminology in what you're gonna need to figure out, but you do need to get something called the top line or the trend document. That just means it's a copy of the questionnaire, all the questions people asked in the order they asked them and the results. And like, I know it's terrible resolution. I, I have a clip and save addiction thing. Um, it'll show you, like this might be, do you approve or disapprove of Barack Obama? It'll show you back over time so you can look at differences. A lot of times this is gonna be online, but if you have to call somebody, that's what you wanna ask for, the trend document or the top line document. And then you'll need the method box. So those are the two things you'll actually need to do what I'm gonna talk to you about doing today. All right, um, the methodology. And hopefully it'll be obvious, but I mean, if it's obvious, then most of your problems are solved because transparency is often a good indicator of a quality product. And lack of transparency is often a good indicator that you're gonna have to spend part of your morning looking into this. Okay, who paid for the poll and why and who conducted the poll? These do seem pretty straightforward, and a lot of times they are straightforward. If you're talking about like a media poll, the poll, you know, this would be like what the method box looks like. You find it, it's squirreled away somewhere on the website, right? Mm -hmm. And the poll was conducted for the Washington Post and ABC News, and then we'll go through some of the other things. And then it'll say who carried out the poll. In this case, it's a social science research solutions. The tricky part in this comes in, the, if you think about it, a lot of the pollsters, including the par partisan pollsters, when it's an off-year election, they're going to be doing corporate work to make money. And so you may see a poll that comes out from a, a pollster you're familiar with, Peter Hart or whatever, um, and who, and, but you may not see who sponsored the poll. You'll just, it'll just say Peter Hart did this poll. I, I saw one, I had one in my presentation to be like equally mean to both sides of the ideological spectrum, but I, dro I just dropped it. But where he had done this poll for Ford Motor Company. And, but it, it wasn't obvious that he had done it for the auto industry. It was just being quoted in the news as a Peter Hart poll. But in fact, it, 
it was it was sponsored at a time when they were do, talking about the auto bailout. So then, if you went and look, if you got the top line, looked at the questionnaire, the way these kind of polls mostly go wrong, it's not in methodology. It's just it's not even in question wording because they 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 know that they're going to release the individual question results that they got. It's often in question order, so they won't show you the whole poll unless you ask. And like in this case, they had like the first question was this long series of things about what would happen in the United States if the U.S. auto industry um, went out of business. And I was like, do you think this would be better or worse? This would be better or worse? Would we have more or less jobs? Would we have more or what? And then they asked, do you support the auto bailout, right? So, of course, they're priming people to think a certain way. You know, that's perhaps not illegitimate for their marketing purposes if they want to know more how to convince people uh, to support the bailout, but it's not, you wouldn't want to put it in your story as this is how, where America is on the bailout. Um, so this was another one. You know, you, you just don't want to be in the fact checker for being the person who wrote up the poll wrong or, you know, whatever the equivalent is in your newspaper. But um, a bunch of these came out around the time of Obama, misleading Obamacare call, poll courtesy of Chamber of Commerce and Harris Interactive. Again, it probably, I don't remember, but it, it often comes out just as a Harris Interactive poll. You then have to do the digging to find out who sponsored the poll. Once you see Chamber of Commerce, you think to yourself, hmm, I think they have a position on Obamacare. Maybe I should look at the poll. And you look at the poll and you don't get embarrassed. And we don't have to go all this, but you know, just as the chamber's been a fierce opponent of the health care law, aka Obamacare, and we frequently warn readers they should always be skeptical of polls peddled by partisan organizations. Blah, blah, blah. So look, there's a variety of organizations that sponsor polls. And you know, honestly, in terms of just methodology, you have to check the way they did it for every one of these. It's not so easy, but in terms of whether they're gonna have a point of view, it's gonna be the same sort of hierarchy of scrutiny that you need to apply that you do in your, in your existing reporting, right? So if it's a campaign or a business or a special interest group, yeah, you better make sure, look at the whole poll and, and, and read all the questions and make sure it sounds okay to you. You know, the federal, state, and local government, not so much into that sort of thing. All right, I, I know I skipped one, I'm gonna come back, don't worry. Um, people talk about and have a lot of questions about this, but it's really pretty basic, which is the margin of sampling error. It's become a survey tradition and part of, of, of journalistic best practices to cite the margin of error. It's not clear to me as polling changes so much if this will continue, but right now, I mean, no, at the Post, you, you couldn't write about a survey without putting the margin of error. And the margin of error is like the smack on the hand. It's the penalty you're paying for sampling the population instead of talking to everybody in the population. And it's based on statistical theory. So it's actually measurable. So we really like it, right? Because we can put a number on it. But there's tons of other error baked into any poll. We just can't quantify that. So we just kind of hang on to this like a lifeline. Um, it's related, this is, I think this is the only really numerical graph I have. I feel kind of sad for you guys. I feel like I gypped you. Um, so the way it works is the margin of error is uh, directly related to the number of people you talk to. It's not, it doesn't really matter how big the population is. This could be a survey of the city of Tampa, a survey of the state of Florida, a survey of the United States, you know, whatever. It's the margin of error doesn't, the, the base population doesn't matter so much. It's the N of the people you talk to. And the reason you tend to see the big national polls mostly sticking around talking to 1,000 people is that when you calculate the formula, the margin of error comes out to be plus or minus three percentage points. And that just means if I say, you know, 50% of America supports gay marriage, stick with the same example, then I'm saying in 95 times out of 100, the real number is going to be between 47 and 53. And that seems like a range that you could kind of handle, right? That's a six-point range. It's like, okay, it's mushy, squint your eyes, but that, that's what it is. As you go down, the margin of error becomes bigger. So the reason you don't see, or the reason you should be careful of, to your point earlier, small sample polls, is you just get a very big margin of error. So if I have a margin of error of plus or minus 14 points, then what I'm saying is between 36% and 64% of Americans support gay marriage which is somewhat less satisfying as a conclusion, right? You really write a different story. So it's not that helpful. And the reason you don't see bigger polls is just because polls are expensive, like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for a thousand person phone poll. So in the industry, if yeah. plus or minus 14 is useless and plus or minus three is acceptable, right. where's the line between the two? Um, it kind of depends five. on what you want to know. Like if you want to know if, some, if something is majority, 
ex, you know, majority popular and, and your majority is falling at like 75, then yeah, maybe you could go even like seven points because you're still knowing most people support it. But on a candidate race, that's pretty useless if you have a seven point margin of error because the candidates are always going to be pretty close and then your margin of errors overlap each other and you, it's hard to say with, uh, with real precision who's so ahead. Most go for three or four percentage points and don't like to see too much below it. Just really basic question. Um, we always make sure to say margin of error so and so points. I've noticed some polls actually put out like plus or minus three percent, which is not the same thing as percentage points. That's is there incorrect. ever? Yeah, there's never a case where someone's no. going to measure in percent, right? No, it's percentage points. You're yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's it's actually easier than a percent. It's just counting up or down. Right. Yeah, and much more meaningful to tell someone. Yes. Yeah. Is yes. there any adjustment in this day and age for the kinds of people who are likely to actually? respond to the phone call or the kinds of people who were likely to actually respond to an internet-based survey? I mean, is it yeah. just simply based off the, the sheer number? Yeah. No. Absolutely the right question. And, uh, and that theme is threaded through this. So what he's talking about is like, is there, how do we know if we have, if we have 10% response rate, how do we know if we have bias? Nine out of 10 people aren't answering. What if... Um, and, and so there's all these studies of what's called non-response bias. What kind of person is less likely to respond and what kind of person is more likely to respond? You know, you can go down quite low, as we've shown. We are quite low. But so far, the people who don't respond don't seem to be meaningfully different. If all Republicans decide to stop responding, you know, then we'd have a 100% Democratic sample, right? But right now, we got this mix. The one thing that they found is that the people who tend to respond to polls are the same kinds of people who tend to volunteer for things, um, maybe a little more politically active. So if you're doing a survey about volunteerism, you're probably going to get over a report. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? The kind of person who feels there's some sort of civic obligation to give their opinion or you know, put their time into things. But no, we don't have a way to adjust for that. But no. you're not seeing it. Not yet. I mean, it is being studied. I, so I want you to rest at ease that it is being studied obsessively because nobody knows. Like, nobody would have thought 10% it would still work. I mean, and it still does. But that doesn't make me feel very comfortable and possibly not you either because you don't know as we go to 9, 8, will it keep dropping? I don't know. How much lower can it go? Um, 10 points lower. <laughs> yeah. How do you find the people who aren't responding to determine? That's a very, are, very good and tricky them. question. Um, what they do is they use, uh, so there's all these tools that have been developed to try and incentivize people to take surveys. And so they'll just apply them. They'll stay in the field forever. They'll um, write a nice letter on like, mostly, I mean, the Pew Research Center's done a lot of these studies. You know, we'll write a nice letter on academic stationery. We'll send people a monetary incentive. Um, you know, whatever we can to up the response rate 10 points and look at those people. The people who are never going to respond to us, no, we don't know. We can look at the demographics of sort of where they're from, and I think as big data comes on, that's one of the things I've been working on a lot of Pew, um, we'll, we'll be able to know more about them, which is kind of creepy, I feel, as an individual, but I feel great about as a pollster. Um, and then, you know, we'll be able to say more. All right. How are they conducted? Okay, this middle part is the hard part, so sip that coffee. All right, modes of administration. This gets to the sort of where the methods, where we are at the edge of the methodology here. So like I said, now we're still on, we're at the end, I think, or we're, we're somewhere near the end of the telephone phone poll era. Um, phone polling is a beautiful thing because of this. We can randomly generate phone numbers. So we know area codes, and we know the first three numbers of your phone number. And then the computer makes up the last four. So even if you have the most private phone ever, like your mom doesn't have it, we can eventually guess it. Like, so everybody with a phone is in our sample. Um, to skip down to the internet, it doesn't work that way for your internet address, right? First of all, there's, there's no even formal listing of your internet, of your email address, or, or you know, Eventually, maybe we can text everybody, but let's bracket that for a while because, you know, most of your older relatives not text friendly right now. But right now, we everybody wants to do email polls because it's so much cheaper and it's so much nicer as a respondent to just take the poll on your own. But we can't get a random sample of internet addresses, right? We can't make up little bunny foo foo at yahoo.com or whatever your crazy, you know, email you've figured out. So we are, people are reverting to in-person surveys. 
which are great, and Americans are really nice about talking to somebody on their doorstep. But it's super expensive if you're doing a national poll, right? You cannot have the kind of random sample that a phone will give you that you can reach into rural North Dakota. I'm just not going to send somebody there, right? I'm just going to say, well, I'm going to send a couple people to Bismarck and, you know, do the best I can with that state. Um, and then mail surveys, which have pretty low response rates, but you can still sometimes get people to do. More and more people are doing hybrid things where it's like, I first try and get you on the phone, and if I can't get you on the phone, but I, I can tie your phone number through one of the big databases to an address, I'll mail you something and I'll ask you to respond on the web, and then, you know, like that. So the internet obviously is the edge, like I said. I mean, part of it is not everybody's on the internet, but hopefully that's, uh, you know, an issue that is self-resolving over time. So obviously an internet poll is not going to get some news on the internet. Um, again, we can't get a random sample of internet address. So, you know, this is the big money option in polling right now. Like, there's a million startups trying to figure this out. And if you can figure it out, you can make yourself some nice money. Because we want to find out a good way to do this. Um, so th the, the bottom line, and I'll walk you through some of the things, is that it requires an extra look to, to understand and report on what you're dealing with. And the issue with the internet survey is that it's, it's often not a probability sample. So let's talk about that. And then we'll hit the rock bottom of complexity and we can come back up. Um, polls are based on probability theory. This is, again, the math of magic to which I was <laughs> referring earlier. And when you do a proper random sample, the theory says you can extrapolate from your sample of 1,000 people to the whole country. And that is the beauty of doing a survey, right? That I'm not going to say the thousand people I spoke to think X, Y, Z. I'm going to say X percent of Americans say, right? That's because the survey is based on probability theory. For a non-probability sample, for, so, for say an internet, you know, online panel of people who have self-selected to agree to answer questions for X, Y, Z company online, right? You can't extrapolate. You can't do what's called a point estimate. You can certainly say, you know, they talked to 1,000 people and 600 said this. That, I mean, for you guys, you know, you're, if you're shoe leather reporters, if you talk to 20, you feel good about yourself. So talking to 1,000, it's not, it's not uh, interesting. <clears throat> it's just not, you just can't give a point estimate on it that's talking about something larger. Probability sample, you can apply a margin of sampling error. For the non-probabilities, you cannot compute that. I think this little, there was a little mini fight over this. The, the internet panels were trying to put margins of sampling errors. The pollsters who were spending money on probability polls were, were giving them a little smack every time. That's kind of stuff. And, and how do you tell which it is? That's kind of what's hard. You're looking at language like a randomly selected sample, a random sample of the national public. And in the internet polls, you're talking about self-selected samples or click-through polls internet panel. So let me show you two different, two different extremes. So this one I would expect you guys could figure out pretty easily. You know when you go on a website and they want to tell you, you know, they, they want to say, readers of this website, come tell me what you think is the most important issue facing whatever, blah, blah, blah. This is just, you always see these around political polls. This is nationalreview.com. It was after one of the debates. Anything that has like Rand Paul or Ron Paul and is like <laughs> online clicking, the, the Paul family always just dominates. They just crush it on the <laughs> online polls. But I'm thinking if you guys saw this, you're going to know, I'm not going to say 58% of Americans said, you know, Rand Paul won the debate. You're going to look for something different. So that's pretty easy. That's just people who happen to read that website clicking through, right? But the, the trickier thing, and what is more common now, what Harris Interactive does, YouGov, a lot of these internet polls is they're doing this hybrid. So online, you go online, you get a click up, it says, do you want to join a survey panel, right? Or do you want to take a survey? You, you click in. And then they get these giant, massive databases of people. And then what they do, so but the, the people are all self-selected, right? Then when they want to do a survey, they pick a random sample of their panel. So it's this weird hybrid. The panel itself is not randomly selected but the sample of the people is randomly selected to match the public. Now, does this work? The problem is we, we just don't know yet. We just don't know. YouGov in particular has a super academic um, following. It was started by Doug Rivers, who's a Stanford professor who started a couple of business. He's a really smart guy. Um, and 
all over the UK, that poll is everywhere. I mean, it, the, the polls they do for the parliament are based on YouGov data. And here, that's where the edge is right now. It's, it's like, that's the best of the internet panels. And they're saying, look, we, we are performing as well as you guys are. It doesn't matter if we look down and we can't see the theory anymore. Look at our results. We're, you know, we're doing well. So what happened a couple of weeks ago is the New York Times upshot ran um, with a YouGov panel. They unfortunately didn't change their online standards, which said the New York Times um, does not publish non-probability panels before they ran the panel in the upshot. So then there got to be this nasty little bit of um, polling infighting going on. Um, that weekend, Scott Clement, who polled at the Post, said, News of the weekend, New York Times and CBS News poll abandoned decades of quality research methods. And then Amy Walter, you know, a really respected political analyst, said, here's the reality. The phone cell only polls dying close to dead. The only question is what replaces it. So then we, we got this. <laughs> this is just a couple weeks ago. CBS, New York Times hit for polling standards. 538, Nate Silver, is the polling industry in stasis or in crisis? The Post, what's right with political polling? A response to Nate Silver. Um, I can't tell you guys the answer of what your comfort level should be, but I can tell you that what would be good for you to do is proactively, if you think you're going to report on this stuff, go back to your newsrooms and make sure you've had this discussion and had a policy in place in terms of where your comfort level is going to be um, in terms of what kind of polls you want to report on in the upcoming election season. It's, it's really challenging in the off-year elections because more of the polls tend to be um, internet polls just because they're so much cheaper and the big organizations don't poll in all the states, but certainly for 2016. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a time of great flux. I think you're less likely to get yourself in big trouble just because it seems like now there's a real movement towards accepting these, but the more um, traditional establishments still are not. The Post still doesn't publish the non-probability polls. So this is our um, survey guru. Scott Keeter, nicest man in polling, um, written a lot of books on the topic. And so all I can tell you is that this is, um, this is where our organization is. And again, we're not doing political polling, so it's kind of easy in a way for us to be here. But it, is Pew Research ever going to use the kind of online non-probability panel the Times and CBS are using? Yes, but the real question is what are we going to use it for? Um, we'll use it for doing experiments or in-depth interviews. We are doing this research to try and like replicate what the private internet panels are doing so that we can show the public, okay, this is what, because right now all their algorithms and whatever are proprietary, so it's very difficult to have any transparency around what they're doing. We're gonna try and replicate that um, in partnership with, with some of the online panels and, and have a public face on that and, and maybe we'll be able to have something to say about what it's useful. Um, but, you know, until we understand the pros and cons of these methods a lot better, we're going to be very cautious about incorporating them into our research. That's where we are. It's the best I can do. Would you like to pause? Because now we're going to... Easy one. It's hot. Are you guys hot? It is hot. <laughs> Presentation's on the <flyer. laughs> um, Okay, so what population is the poll trying to represent this? This is kind of a maybe one. I, I haven't seen anybody mess that up too much. But you should at least know around the political polls, the only place you can get tripped up is sometimes they do it of everybody, and sometimes they just do it of registered voters. That's done mostly by asking people, are you registered to vote? Um, you just need to be clear when you write up the result of the survey which one it is, because the numbers are different, and real political insiders, if you don't put it in, they're going to call you and ask you. Um, sometimes you see polls um, sample registered voters, and sometimes you see them like poll likely voters. Likely voters. What's a, what's exactly. a likely voter and how yeah. you find that? Yeah. So, great question. So, as you get closer to the election, people will not just settle for registered voters because, as we know, there's just what 70 some odd percent of Americans are registered, and that is not what we get turning out at the polls, right? It's a lot lower than particularly in the off years. So, part of the tricky part about being um, a, an election survey researcher is that you have to then find out who do you think is actually going to turn out. Because the thing is, it's PC to tell people that you're going to turn out. So if I ask you, are you going to vote? You're like, totally. Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, so how do you pound people down? So when you're getting a likely voter screen, it's just tightening it. It's more. It'll, it'll ask you, did you vote last time? 
do you know where your polling place is? Can you tell me where your polling place is? It, it's a series of screener questions. Have you been paying attention to the race? They don't usually ask you knowledge questions like, do you know, can you name the candidates? But they'll just ask you a series of questions to get the percentage down to the, the harder core people. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. It's, it's, it's the worst part of election polling, trying to get that screen right. So is there, should we be, because I know that likely voter polls yeah. are, I don't get the impression that they're treated skeptically. Is that something no, we should? No, uh-uh. Okay. No, I don't think so. You just have to know what you're dealing with. I mean, I'm just saying from the perspective of someone who's tried to get it, get the estimate right, that's where you can go wrong because enthusiasm for the candidates uh, ebbs, you know, ebbs and go, goes up and down. And sometimes that will affect who says they're going to turn out to vote. But then something happens in the last minute and it changes. There's like a last minute enthusiasm. You got the wrong screen. You know, you, you left people out who actually turned out. It's messy. It's messy business. <laughs> So again, just talking about um, people who are included and not included in surveys, I just wanted to point out that one thing that people complain about who don't like the um, robocall polls is that um, you can't, there's a law that says you can't auto dial people's cell phones and all the field houses rely on those auto dialers because they don't want to, first of all, it's more efficient than having your interviewer type in the phone number and second of all, the interviewer makes a lot of mistakes. So it's just the interviewer sitting there and waiting for the computer to dial, you know, click through or whatever, but you can't do that for cell phones. So it makes the cell phone survey more expensive because you have to have someone punch it. So a lot of the robo polls don't include cell phones. And you know, that just is getting harder and harder. I mean, they're trying to figure out a way around that. That, that used to be feasible, but now it's just crazy. This is post ABC internal data from 2009 to 12. And this is the 18 to 29 year olds. Um, you know, the percent who were taking their survey on cell versus landline, and this is 65 plus, you know, the opposite. But you really have trouble. If you think young people are going to make a difference in your election, like, if, say, an Obama election, you really want to make sure you've got cell phone interviews going. No, Timing of poll, that's pretty easy. Just make sure you double check the date was pretty recently. I've seen some campaigns try and trip you up by putting out a poll and kind of burying how old it was, you know, trying to release poll results that were from before their candidate had like a major gaffe or something. So, you know, just check the date of the poll. Um, and again, we're cycling fully back to this, this issue of question wording and order. I feel like it's simultaneously, um, it's, it's probably the most common way you see a poll bias, and it's also just the easiest to spot if you take the time to get the questionnaire. You're a reporter, you know what a good question is. Um, I trust you don't you don't do interviews where you're asking questions that are complicated or presume information the person doesn't know. They're leading, they're double-barreled, um, they are loaded with emotional words, give biased or unequal information, you know. You, you can read a poll question and see if you think it's, it's bad or good. You'll be able to tell. The order is trickier, and, but if you, if you read the questionnaire and just think through it, I think you can see it pretty easily as well. Um, but I do want to point out that wording, I mean, it's not just nefarious wording experiments. It's, you know, it's not just the, I remember there was a, a seatbelt, there was like a seatbelt campaign poll where the first question was, do you know anyone who's ever been in a car accident? And then the next thing was like, did you favor or oppose a seatbelt law? So it's like, as you're envisioning your, you know, bloody friend, they're going to ask you about seatbelts. It, it's not always that. Um, Wording, people are super sensitive to wording. I mean, think about even just trying to talk with your partner and the way like one word you put in there can throw somebody the wrong way. And that happens in surveys too. People are pretty smart. So um, this is just a wonky table I pulled from one of ours. We do a lot of question wording experiments as we're trying to figure out the right way to report on public opinion. This was on the NSA um, and talking about um, support for you know the NSA surveillance. And we didn't know how to word the question, so we did all these different varieties. So if you mention like, that this was being done with court approval, you would be 12 points higher in favorability than if you um, didn't. If you mentioned it was part of anti-terrorism efforts, you'd be nine points higher. Um, if you talked about what kind of data was being collected, it would be better to talk about metadata than recordings and text. Um, and, and so sometimes you're just changing the result by inadvertently you've you know you've put in a, a certain bit of information that changes it and so the people who are writing these questionnaires if they're really trying to be unbiased and nonpartisan 
they're working super hard to think like what's the bare minimum way I can put this in and be really straightforward about it um, and not accidentally you push people the wrong way. And sometimes you still do. Um, and that's why it's better to have more polls than less on a topic because you can at least sort of surround an issue and, and talk about a range of support for something. Okay, this one I do see a lot of reporters go bad on, and this is because of what I perceive to be a changing na the nature of reporters, which is you guys are coming in a lot more math savvy than perhaps people um, were coming into the newsroom 20 years ago. And, but this is largely the default of just not being familiar with weird and goofy polling notation. So this is something that I pulled from one of our questionnaires. It was after the Heartbleed bug. Um, we do a lot of stuff about the internet. <coughs> so do you think your own online personal information was put at risk by the Heartbleed bug, or do you think your information was not put at risk? 45% own information put at risk. If you're on a rush on deadline, and you're just reporting this question out, you could easily just, it says 45, like you number check it, um, and say 45% of Americans think that their information was put at risk. Except, up here in the questionnaire, it's only asked of people who, one, heard a lot or a little about Heartbleed. In other words, if you've never heard of Heartbleed, I'm not going to ask you if it affected you, right? Because you're going to be like, what are you talking about? And it's only asked if you're an internet user. So the actual, so right, it's not asked of your full population. So if you want to know what percent of Americans, you've got to back that number out, back to the full base of people. People should do that on their top lines for you. They don't always do it. Um, I would just, I would just <laughs> raise it as a red flag for you. If you really get into the weeds, make sure you read all the information, you know, around the question, um, and possibly also the report, or call the pollster if you have any questions about that. But I do see that mistake happening a lot. Okay, last thing. Were the data weighted, and if so, to what? When you say you weight your data, it really does sound sort of horrible. It sounds like you're just cheating. It's like you're just admitting publicly that you're cheating with your data. Um, everybody weights their data. You know, the government agencies weight their data. All the weight, weighting your data means that, like, like you were asking before, um, we do see certain biases in who will answer the phone and who won't. So it's harder to get young people on the phone. So what they do is they take the census, which is our actual count of, you know, who's who in this country. And um, we say, okay, we only got 20% of our sample being under age 25, but really we know it should be 30%. So we're going to weight that part of the data up. So on those meaningful, usually people weight to age, race, sex, and education to make the country look back, if you're looking at national data, um, like it should. And so if you see that, it's not necessarily a red flag. It's actually, in most cases, best practices. And so this is the kind of thing you'll see. The combined results have been weighted to adjust for variation in the sample or they region. Oh, they do region too. Sex, race, Hispanic origin, age, education, number of adults in the household. Everybody does it. So when I'm trying to teach new reporters how to write up a poll, I tell them they should try and if you're, right, if you're in charge of a poll story, you want to look at three things. You want to get the top line. You want to say, overall, what does this say about the population being studied? Here's how Americans feel about gay marriage. Here's what they think about the Supreme Court thing. Here's the blah, blah, blah. Then you want to break it down and look at interesting subgroups, right? The poll is not just a top line data. The whole point of the poll is that you can pull out demographic subgroups and analyze them. So when it comes to gay marriage, you really want to look at age because you know that um, attitudes vary greatly by age on this topic. So in your story, you'll then want to say, you know, this is largely driven by attitudes among those under age 35, nine out of 10 of whom say blah, blah, blah. Seniors, on the other hand, blah, blah, blah. And then you want to look at the overtime trend and you want to say this is fairly st uh, stable across the last year, but represents a major change from seven years ago when the poll showed this. And that's your story, those three things, right? So the top line, the subgroups, and the trend over time. You know, be careful with causality. You don't have to say what drove what. Don't fall into that trap. Just, you know, <laughs> just report the results. Um, sometimes if you get like a weird poll and you're like, whoa, I haven't seen you know, if this is your beat and you're thinking, I've never seen a number like this before, but it's from a credible organization and you vetted it, 
you just have to write through it like anything else. You just say, you know, a new poll. Like, there was a big um, thing just this week about, you know how Scotland's trying to take a vote as to whether to become a dependent? Thank you. Become a dependent, dump the rest of the UK. It was YouGov, was it? It was a YouGov poll came out, and for the first time, the yes vote was up three. So the poor reporter who got that survey, you then have to write the story. You have to write through the story that says, here's what they found, you know, here's what they did, and then high up you have to say, uh, a bevy of other polls, you know, released in the recent days have shown somewhat different results. Uh, you know, the poster from YouGov said, well, this is blah, 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 blah. Then, you know what I mean? You just have to write through it like any other story. It kind of stinks, but once in a while you're going to get that. And, and you, you, can't, you can't know until the next three polls come out whether it was right or whether it was a, a wacky. So I've had this happen before, yeah. um, and like you said, you know, the pollster from YouGov said, but like when you call pollsters about their poll, all of them are just going to say like pretty it's generic true. things. Yeah. So like, is there anything you can go to when you've got several polls that say the different thing? Is there a type of person you can call to help right. you figure out like, should I throw out any of these or right. like... I mean, how do you evaluate, or do you just have to say, like, they're all done fairly well, right. and we're just going to have to wait and see? Well, first you decide, I mean, I don't know, you're a political, right? Do, yeah. do they have a standard on reporting the, you know, you have to say, like, which polls fall within our current standards, and then you sort of report on those. Yeah. But I agree, if you, it depends, if you're, if you're talking to someone who's with it, who's done a campaign and they're releasing their poll or done something like this Scotland poll, you're right, they're not going to be, they're just going to say, well, our poll's right and their poll's crap and end of story. Um, you could always, you can try. Sometimes and they don't even say that, though. Sometimes they say, like, we did ours, you know, like, right. methodologies vary and right. thus you may have different results. Right. Um, lots of states have um, local survey centers and I recommend you know especially if you have a state beat finding out what of your which of your universities has a local survey center because it'll be run by somebody who's jointly faculty and doing the survey so they're likely to know something about polling and probably willing to go on the record criticizing other people's polls um, you can try to um, you know you're not gonna be able to get like the head of a or something to come on on every you know once a week on every poll that comes across your beat but if it's something pretty substantial, like if it would have been this poll about Scotland and I was a you know reporter in the UK, I would have I would have asked for a statement from somebody like that. Mm -hmm. That's worth a try. Okay. I have a similar question about yeah. validity. When campaigns refer to their internal polls uh -huh. and those polls aren't released, yeah. Um, given the expense involved, generally, how are they doing them? They're usually pretty good. The problem is they don't want to release things that don't look good for them. So you don't know if you're getting, you're only going to hear about their poll if they're up, right? They're not going to release their poll if they look bad. They're, and they're probably not going to release all the items on their poll. So I don't know. What have other people done about campaign um, polls? Yeah. ABC, we're not allowed to Yeah, ABC, so I do um, exit polling, consulting for ABC News, and the head pollster for ABC News is notoriously yeah. hardcore. So Gary, Gary Langer. Gary yeah. Yeah. We, um, we are supposed to ask if we can get it, first of all, and I don't right. think we report any if we can't get a copy of the actual of, question, the full question. Right, right. but it's also always, and I was going to ask this as well, yeah. like it's also always reported as an internal survey yes. because sometimes, right. like, what the campaign itself is hearing and believing is interesting as that, as opposed right. to like, this is the state of the race, but it's like, I mean, I think we wrote one this morning that was like, you know, so-and-so's internal poll shows them up seven, which, you know, like, is a way of saying this is what they're hearing in their echo chamber without presenting it as like... Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's good context, even if it's not. Like yeah. Right, that kind of thing, but I don't know. Yeah, and sometimes it's good to try and develop a relationship with, if, you know, if, if you're in a state that most of the polls are done by the same person. It's worth trying to get to know that person and attempt to get some sort of rapport so that you can get more of an on background. Seriously, <laughs> you know, you're gonna make me look like an idiot because they don't, you know, they don't want to trash themselves. But you just have to be careful, and you have to probably always put it in the context of the last public poll, which the problem is a lot of them aren't going to be probability telephone polls right now if you're doing state races. It's really frustrating. Okay, this is, um, I guess I'm working on right now where there's probably a sample population only of, let's say, 40. That's 40? That's, well, the sample population is wrong. There. But there's, there's 40 different entities that all do something that I'm looking at. 
and I want to ask them all the same question, basically devise my own little poll for all 40 and say, uh -huh. do you do this or do you not? Um, is the 40 a sample of some other larger group, or is it a census of everybody who does this in your sample field? Sample of a larger group, actually. No, you just have to... You just have to write it as, you just have to write through that. You, you can't, you, what you can't do, say you're talking to 40 hospitals, right, or 40 nonprofit hospitals, and you've selected them not at random, you've selected them yourself. Then you just have to say, you have to treat it like you're talking about interviews. I wouldn't say X percent said this. Right. I would always use the number. 19 of the hospitals with which we spoke said this. Because you don't want to make it sound like you're trying to project all nonprofit hospitals because you can't from that sample. If you talk to 40 people, that's a lot of people to talk to, and you can, you know, feel strongly about that, but just write it as, don't write it up as a poll. Another question. You mentioned exit polling. So what are the best practices for using exit polling on election night? Now you don't have too much of a choice because exit polling is so freaking expensive that now there's just one exit poll. There used to be a couple competing exit polls. Now all the networks um, go in together and do one. So exit polling basically is this crazy retro but so cool thing where they pick uh, precincts at random, they send live interviewers, and the live interviewers stand outside with, have you guys ever gotten exit poll? They stand outside with the one page thing and they count feet and every ninth person they stop and ask them to take the survey. And it's been, it's, it's had some problems. There's all kinds of weird, crazy biases in it. One year it came out really low on Republicans. And they didn't, they couldn't, they, they never exactly ascertain why, but one thing they thought was it, they might have had too many young interviewers, and they felt that for some reason the Republicans were less likely to speak to the young interviewers when they looked at the data, so they had to up the age of their population. And then because a lot of them are, Fox News is one of the sponsors, but as like the mainstream media has gotten perceived as, you know, potentially more biased from Republicans, they thought maybe the fact that they had all the logos on the top um, was biasing people. But what happens is it's all happening live that night. I mean, it's up until the last time they did it. It's literally being called in. The interviewer, like, finishes their things, and then every hour they, they phone in their results, and then it's all getting tabulated, and it gets spit out. And really what the exit poll is, this is, again, this is, this is so... This is like so high-minded as to be laughable, but it's also deeply true. It's really interesting because it's it's how you know why people voted the way they did, or what they meant, or what they wanted, or or how a candidate put together a coalition. Because otherwise, you can't see the demographics of the voting population. We don't keep demographics, right? We know how many people voted, but we don't know. You know, did Barack Obama like kill among the Latino vote, or was it just like his complete solidity in the African American vote? Like you just don't know, right? And it, without the exit poll, but really on election election night, all everybody wants exit, exit polls for is because it allows you to like tweak your newscast <laughs> on television um, early on to, to towards who the winner is. And there's all kinds of rules about, about it. But if you can get a hold of the exit poll, yeah, you should definitely do it there. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really well vetted. I'm just, I'm telling you it's been wrong sometimes, but I'm still telling you it's totally worth getting and reporting out. It's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a world of pain for the Gallup organization. Um, it, it was there, I don't know. There was like a big review that you can look at by Mike, the, this professor at Michigan named Mike Traugott did a review for Gallup of everything that could have been wrong. Did anybody look at it by any chance? Um, they do a different voter screen. It was like his question earlier. It's like, how do you determine who gets in your likely voter screen? Something their voter screen is more elaborate it's like a 10 question screen they assign everybody a probability of turning out and it just didn't work and they're just trying to figure out why best I can tell you yeah 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 I'm so glad you asked me that because I, I, I meant to address that, which is really when you're trending over time, if you want to be conservative, which is what I generally like to be when I'm interpreting polls, I'm looking at the same organization. I'm looking at the exact same question wording, not one word changed by the same organization with the same field house. That's what I would trend, you know, if I was going to talk about it. Now, 
the way what's happened over the past five seven years is the aggregators like 538 they're saying look uh i'm not going to do I'm, I'm not going to do that i'm going to throw everything in and i know that some of it's like more and less blurry like more or less accurate but if i aggregate things over time if i if i throw everything in you know and i have this many points i'll be able to see a trend and i think there's some value in that too but what i wouldn't do as a reporter is i wouldn't say um you know senator roberts had a 68 percent approval rating uh, in gallup this year which is up 14 points from you know the kansas city star poll in one month earlier. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't talk about a specific change, you know, in two points at a time across two different polls. I would either look at a big aggregate or stick with the same organization, same trend line. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Or someone who had any type of religion versus being an atheist. Right. And individually, a lot, and there are like so many more. These things have obviously have context in other polls, but on a whole, how do you write through something like that that largely, like, I wasn't able to find previous polls that asked uh, the same question? Um, well. Or do you need to write through it, I guess? Right, right, right. If you want to say, is this, is this new or different, then you would need to find other data. Um, uh, some of your organizations <coughs> might have access to the Roper database. So all the public surveys um, back to Gallup in the 1930s are saved um, in something called the Roper database. It's at the University of Connecticut. It's worth checking. It used to be online free, and now it's membership. Well, a lot of universities have it. Um, the Post had it. I, I imagine some of the bigger places you guys work for have it. AP, I'm sure, has it. Um, and there you can just search the questions and look. But Pew should be able, I mean, like in that case, they, they likely have trend. And if you could have gotten the top line, which usually is easy in somewhere like Pew, you could find the last askings and you could say. I think Americans, in that case, pretty much always want a religious veteran. If we could find a good religious veteran who wasn't, wasn't gaff prone, they could get get the job but um yeah um is there any discussion in the uh like polling community um i don't want to call you guys um is there any discussion about <laughs> the like causal relationship between polls and like voter turnout is that yeah one, is there is there the discussion too is there a yeah. concern that you know a really tight race would then increase voter turnout or yeah. um, a blowout would decrease voter turnout and especially given all these added concerns about accuracy of polls could you know, actually change yeah. the outcome somehow. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion of that and actually the best analysis of it is usually in the political science literature so they'll try and look for that. So basically what he's saying is if you come out with a poll that says, oh my god this race is neck and neck, does that motivate supporters to come out Vice, you know, and vice versa if you say it's a blowout then you know, the front runner. You you always will hear that from campaign managers. They'll always call and yell at you and be like, that is totally not the state of the race. My internal poll says something completely different. You're going to unmotivate my voters or whatever. I think the, I think that is probably overblown, but I think what's real is that polls in races, in um, lower ballot races, affect fundraising. So, like, if you can have one good poll that shows you have a chance of beating so-and-so, it's going to really improve your chances of raising money. So then you just have to hope it's a good poll because then it's just reflecting the truth, which is that people might like my guy, gal. Um, but I don't know. It's kind of a dated example. Everybody always talks about the example of Jimmy Carter. It's like, you know, sometimes a candidate comes out of nowhere. There's no poll that shows anyone's ever heard of him, you know, that he has any shot of winning and then he goes to win. So it's clearly, you know, not d determinative. Oh, sorry, just a quick follow-up. What happened? What like? What's your take on the Eric Cantor pulling and that? I mean, is there? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't. You know, I, I truthfully didn't follow up on. I, I haven't followed up on that story enough to comment intelligently. So you guys know what happened. Like he said, this poll said he was going to win, and it was by a long-standing Washington pollster. A lot of these guys, and they are almost all guys, are instant polling institutions. You know, there was a lot of stories after that just saying, 
how come no pollster ever loses their job, you know, <laughs> over getting this so wrong? It was about like 34 points or something. It was, <laughs> it, was like it, it was way outside the margin of error, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, this. I think this gets to another issue, which is it can be really difficult to find good polling in small house races. Um, but, like, if you find a poll, generally they're sort of polling institutions we all kind of trust. And right. we do a quick skim to make sure nothing yep. looks wonky, but right. you sort of like, okay, yep. that one we yep. can report. But if you come across an interesting poll from a polling institution you may have never dealt with before, um, you know, obviously you can dig through the poll, but s like sometimes you don't have the math or the expertise yeah. to evaluate right. the methodology or you say it's proprietary or whatever. So what are some ways you can sort of quickly vet an institution you may not know? Um... Google. <laughs> um, you can call the rival pollster. It's worth a try. They'll certainly tell you at least all the red flags to look out for. Oh, that, you know, that guy, he does total, like his sample is from an internet panel of Bolivians or, you know, whatever it is they're going to. Um, and then, like I said, I mean, if this sounds like something you're going to be covering a lot, you're just going to need to make some more polling friends. You may need to, like, come down and go to APOR one year to the conference and meet some of the folks that do this. If you can make friends with somebody who's in one of the big newsrooms like Gary Langer, like he has a list. He has a four air list that ABC has available to them. And they're adding stuff all the time. The guys at the Post have the same thing. You guys may have the same thing. Yeah, we've got the Stephen Shepard who wrote it's the hard. story. He's brought in a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard when you have a new organization. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. You may have to call them and go through these questions with them and then see if anything, you know, uh, raises red flags. Yeah. Do you think journalists over rely on polls like as a way to just fill in holes in their yeah. copy when they have nothing else to go to? No, like, I think we need more, more, uh, <laughs> more, more polls. Or do I mean, like, as someone who is not a journalist, yeah. obviously you do the polling. Like, when do you think it really makes sense for a journalist to use a poll because it's going to enhance the reporting and not just to throw it in there or something else? Well, I'd love to hear you guys talk about that. I mean, do you have a take on it yourself? Um, I mean, it's good to hear from an outsider. Like, yeah. I feel like since that we're in a yeah. bubble in a way, yeah, like right. we sometimes just get caught up in trying to fill the story and like right. get it out there. So, um, I mean, I think it shouldn't be a shortcut for reporting, and it shouldn't be a shortcut for getting you out there and talking to some of the same Americans that are being interviewed in the poll. But I do think that it's often a corrective to people's conventional wisdom. And you know, obviously, I'm biased because I'm an I'm an advocate for sort of good use of polls. I think it can be a correction for conventional wisdom. I think it can be a way to show that your anecdote is not just, you know, a red herring; that it's actually representative of whatever phenomenon you're writing about. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I have a question. I have no comment. You, you generate a comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they, well, I work at Real Clear Politics, and my yeah. bread and butter is oh, the yeah. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Why have you been chiming in, man? <laughs> yeah, so they're always, they're always happy when I include a according to the RCP average. <laughs> right, right, so right. I definitely think it enhances <laughs> Um But my, my question was, uh, it's curious to, and it might be a little myopic or getting into the weeds, but first one is, so I, I'm from California, and I always remember the ballot says profession, name, and party. Like, that's what it says. How relevant is uh, the ballot, you know, like the, the act, what's on the actual ballot to what poll question you're asking? As in like, uh, what, what, if the election were held today, would you vote for a Democratic businesswoman, you know, Shelly Moore Capito or whatever? Um, how, how important is the question of how they describe the candidates in determining the outcome? The other one is, do the third party candidates throw it off? Because sometimes you'll say like a libertarian polling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I've never seen, I've never worked anywhere where you, we put the profession in. I've only seen it where you put the name, not even the honorific of Governor, you know, Mitt Romney. I've, I've, the practice I've always learned is you just put their name in their party ID. Now, by putting in their party ID, obviously you're queuing, but you're hopefully queuing people in, you know, in a way that helps enhance your estimate, right? Um, Third party candidates are really, really hard, really hard to pull because a lot of people feel like my Uncle Lou, he's in love with every third party candidate who comes along, but when it comes down to election day, he just can't bear to waste his vote. But he'll tell every pollster until then, oh, he's still he's still not over Ross Perot. Um, so those are very challenging, those are very challenging elections. And then I think what, like if you, there's been some interesting critiques that Nate Silver piece that I um, cited the headline to. It's really, it's worth reading. I don't always agree with him. I often agree with him. But 
um, he was saying that pollsters are, are use a, we have a crutch right now, which is that because politics is so predictable, like Democrats very rarely default from their candidates, Republicans very rarely default from their candidate. If you know someone's party and their race, it's pretty easy to predict how they're going to vote at the national level. And there, and his point is, so, so what happens when that gets thrown off? So like if we got something where, you know, independents all of a sudden had a chance with people and we couldn't as easily tell by their party ID who they might actually vote for, or, you know, what if sort of the, the structure of how race and politics interacts gets messed with like how are the polls going to do i don't know i don't know because it's true it is it is kind of easy now in some ways that's why you're waiting to age and race and education whatever fixes fixes your estimate yeah um so are there any like techniques or uh, technologies on the horizon that people are experimenting with to uh for getting in contact with people that could Place the hate, <clears throat> the hate of, like, yeah, yeah. So the thing they're trying to figure out now is text surveys. Like, would you answer a text survey? Obviously, somebody like me, that's going to be very limiting for me because, you know, the surveys we do might be like 80 questions on how do you feel about religious institutions in the U.S. or whatever. I mean, I'm not going to be able to text it to you. If you're doing just uh, who you're going to vote for, maybe that would work. Um, so the trouble is, so far, the technology is not standardized enough. Like even for us, we just created our own. Like as part of our experimentation to sort of you know build a life raft for survey research, one thing we did was create a panel of people. We we chose them through a random probability sample. We had a big 10,000 person poll. We asked all of them, "Would you stay in our panel and keep taking surveys?" And 50% said yes. 50% of of the 10,000 who already had a 10% 10, 10 response rate. So don't think I'm boasting. Um, and for those people now, we know how to reach them. And so we have their cells. And so we know that some of them are taking the surveys on mobile. But even there, you know, even though we feel like we're so technologically advanced, like a lot of people, when we tried to send pictures, like something about their particular phone didn't make the picture show right, or like some of the response options were off the side of the screen. It's like these really seemingly boring small technical prompts kill you kill you kill you so we don't really have a way to do that yet but that's what people are talking about text would you guys take a text survey no 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 way, no way. Texted me if i'm really bored that, yeah. that, <laughs> that you were if i knew that you were a reputable polling organization right and you texted me a link you would go to the link and take it on the metro i might go to the link depending on I, I mean, I'm a cybersecurity reporter, so I'm a little biased, but it's <laughs> very, very, very hard to verify who the heck is sending you a text right. message. Right. And I wouldn't click a link in a random text message or, like, even respond to suddenly be on someone's, like, spam list. Or but I mean, if it came from someone reputable, if it said it was coming from Pope Francis, I would definitely click on it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that's a high bar. <laughs> I don't Francis think the Pope does a lot of you and saying, I'm the Pope. <laughs> in between prayers. <laughs> Nigeria, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering what you think about the fact that it seems like everyone does polling now. I know. It's like I get yeah. so many pitches every single day from like so and so PR agency and like so and I've never heard of any of them and they all it's have like what she was saying before, you know, yeah. Back to school spending and right. um, well, those just like kind of mundane things like that, and you're just right. like inundated with poll after poll after poll. And I start to, I disregard all of them because I'm just like, oh my god, I'm so tired of. Right. What's your beat? Personal finance. Yeah. And so there's tons of. It's always like, millennials have no credit cards. Millennials really love credit cards. Millennials have lots of debt. Millennials don't have debt. Millennials like to, you know, have no retirement savings. Millennials do have retirement savings. It's, 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 I mean, it's every single day. It's just back and forth. And so I've kind of gotten to the point where I hate writing about polls because, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I just feel like I'm just getting so many of them. Yeah. I don't trust any of them. Um, but I'm just interested. I'm just curious, like, yeah. why is it that so many... Because um, journalists like them. Yeah. Just because journalists like them. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's a way to make your own personal opinion seem like it's ha, has more heft, or your own you know take on the story is is part of the zeitgeist or whatever. I mean, I think I would I would take it like any pitch. I would say 
I'd read it. I'd be like, if if this seemed interesting, I probably myself would go to the next step of of at least looking at who did the poll and then trying to see if I could, you know, easily rule it in as a probability survey or not. If it wasn't in your case, I think that's an easy way to thin it out really fast. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like, there's some stuff on consumer finance that is good, like all the consumer sentiment indexes and stuff. You know, you, you couldn't really dump those because, the, you know, they move the market and, and things. But, yeah, I take your point. It's definitely overkill. Matt, is there anyone getting favorite cultures? When you see an email from so-and-so, you automatically... Not allowed to say. Mm -hmm. Peer Research Center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I've personally, like a lot, of, I, I think a lot of the mainstream media polls that have been around a long time are good and pretty transparent. I do look for transparency. I look for some sort of seriousness on the polling aspect of their web page. I'm intrigued by what YouGov's doing. We, Like I said, we don't do that methodology yet, but I think of the internet panels, um, they're, they're kind of ahead, at least in that race. Um, I, st I still look at the Gallup poll, you know. Yeah. It's funny on the YouGov thing because my editor is British and we got it, oh, a YouGov yeah. pitch and I was like, I've never heard of these people. He's like, no, 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 they're really respected. Yeah. Um, but I was going to ask along the lines of, you know, I know that today is like covering campaigns, but I'm also a beat reporter. Um, and you mentioned you want to see polls used beyond horse race coverage. So what are some of the ways that you think like issue polling or idea polling or sort of non-campaign polling yeah. could be better used by journalists? Well, I mean, I think it, it's it's each individual to your beat. But like for you, you know, we we're doing a lot of work on people's. We have a big survey coming out soon on people's attitudes towards privacy. In October, right? Oh, I think I've been emailing yeah. with Lee about it. Yeah, yeah, with Lee. <laughs> um, so you just you have to think about what are the sort of stru what are the structural ways that the public and the way they feel about things interacts with whatever you're covering. So, you know, the millennial story at some level. That is going to be interesting. You know, maybe you take all the pitches and you start saying, okay, they're all circling around this theme of, you know, millennials and their spending habits. What real data can I get and authoritatively, you know, sort through all this mess and, and, write, and write through that? I mean, we're doing a lot now about generations and, um, you know, important social trends around them. So one thing we're finding is that there's just a massive de-affiliation from religious institutions among young people and that's the kind of societal story that you can back up and talk about with survey data that has really big ramifications and that you know that's that doesn't solve your reporting problem that just starts your reporting problem of how do I explain this and how do I understand it um, so find some good pollsters who poll in your area and see what they're doing. And, and you can pitch people, too. Like, um, a lot of pollsters who do those kind of polls like to hear it. Like, we do. We like to hear what people are interested in knowing because we can't think of every interesting idea ourselves. How valid do you think um, all the surveys that are coming out about Gen Z are? Oh, is that going to be the new name? That's, That's like so unoriginal. Generation. God. <laughs> I just know, I think yeah. a lot of people did. I literally just said no to a pitch today about um, how Gen Z wants to become a ho they all like want to become homeowners. And I was like, they're 13. Like, yeah, right, like, seriously. I probably said I wanted no. to buy a house when I was in eighth grade too. Like, but, right. you know, he was like, you are the best person to cover this story. And I don't even know who did it, like Better Homes and Gardens. Right. I really but, need your guidance. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I, just, I, I feel like that's like the next thing that posts. This is actually like a really funny, you know, by you know, by way of this whole discussion, which is this whole generation thing, because nobody knows when to end the generation. Like so, Gen X, so Gen, what are the millennials? It's still open for business, but now it's like people eighteen to thirty one or 32 I mean it's getting really large but we don't have a government body to say we are now closing the millennial generation <laughs> for business and we're going to start a new one and so we do a lot of generational analysis so I haven't heard Gen Z that seems silly I think at some point you just look and you're like that's silly and then you just whoosh, boom yeah we have time for one more question if there is one in the room Gen Z anybody <laughs> going once the like oh. five Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, got a hand in the back. Um, I feel like more and more these days our stories are based just on polling information that comes out and not yeah. using polling as like an accessory or like something to kind of add some yeah. extra text. That's like to your point. Do you have any 
advice or? No, I mean, that's hard just because that's just budget, right? That's just nobody will send you to go out and talk to people, to go to wherever they're building the, you know, Alaskan pipeline and talk to people along the pipeline. So you're just going to write about what Americans think about the pipeline. And that's just the swing of the pendulum. You know, one thing is, um, if you have your own polls in-house or if your organization does polling, one thing that's kind of cool is that a lot of polls, most of the media polls um, at the end, I, I, would, I would imagine Politico does this, so for the last, at the end of the poll they say, can a reporter um, contact you to follow up on this topic? And then you as a reporter might be able to go to your polling desk and say, look, I'm doing a story on... Um, Gen Z, can you find me some respondents who are randomly selected, you know, in your poll that you know from the demographic questions in your poll have kids that age or whatever, or who are super privacy concerned, though they probably didn't answer a poll, but um, you know what I mean? You can, and then, and then at least you can talk to people that aren't from Alexandria, you know, Silver Spring and whatever. You can c talk to the lunch lady in Topeka or wherever, and uh, it, it, I think that does help. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right, we are going to wrap this up. I want you to stay in your seats for just a minute because we have a couple of announcements before lunch. Um, Claudia, thank you so much. You're so welcome. It was awesome. really nice to talk to you guys. Good luck.